on the plant and this we use for when people has gallbladder problems we use this one I give my knowledge away because I got it from the older people they gave me their knowledge and I feel that I have to give that knowledge to other people, to young people, so they can spread it. Besides collecting medicinal plants, Dina is on a mission to also preserve them. In the early 1980s, she began Den Paradera, a magnificent botanical garden where she propagates over 300 species. When Dina was unable to find certain types on Curaçao, she traveled to the neighboring islands of Bonaire and Aruba, where the plants had not yet been eliminated from the landscape. Yes, I started in Paradera because I, I saw that we were losing a lot of information, a lot of herbs. You could be today here and, f and see a lot of herbs. The next day you would be um, not finding them anymore. So I started to, to bring the herbs to this garden to keep the knowledge. The garden is very important to me because I cultivate the medicinal herbs. So we can know the stories, we can know what kind of herbs we have on this island and also to learn how to use it. It will be a pity that we lose all the information of the uses of the culture, you know, because people don't know how to use uh, the herbs. The garden is divided in three parts, the botanical part, the historical part, and the production. The botanical parts are the herbs divided in sections for the digestion, for the heart, for the respiratory system. You know, when I started, the people, the people thought I was crazy because I had a good job. Why should I go and make my hands dirt with the land? So they thought, you know. But I had that dream that I needed to, to conserve the culture conserve the information and to have the plans so um, I went on even if, if people were were laughing it didn't matter the slaves when they came here they brought seeds you know nobody knew that they had the seeds with them they wanted to survive they didn't know where they were going you know and also when they were here they could recognize some of the trees and plants that they had in Africa there were people who know the medicinal healing, so as uh, the medicinal doctors, you know, the medical, the, the healing doctors, so they could go to those uh, healing doctors so they could find help. Here in the Kurahulanda Museum in nearby Willemstadt, actors from the Living History Theater Group portray plantation life and the tragic plight of the captured Africans. Should be good. Should be nice to you. Go. I'll be okay. Go. 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 Keep that one away from her. Stop. Experts estimate that during the 18th and 19th centuries, millions of people were enslaved along Africa's western coast. The Dutch, in need of securing their new colony, used slave ships to cross the 5,000 miles treacherous sea. It was a long, arduous journey to reach the tiny island of Curaçao. Yeah, the slaves arrived here on front of the building and uh, they were unshipped here. You must imagine they were on the ship for six to eight weeks, but most of them... Leo Helms is the director of the Curahulanda Museum, which is built on the very site of Curaçao's old slave market and they were very weak and in very bad condition when they arrived here. And then and they stayed here on the property for one or two, two months yeah, to get a little bit more stronger. They sent them out to the other mansions on the island to be trained how to work on the plantations. From here they were shipped to Cuba and North America. Those that stayed behind in Curaçao learned how to adapt to their new life. Many had come from rich West African kingdoms, proud civilizations that had thrived in Mother Africa. 
Even though the slaves suffered unimaginable hardships, many of their old customs endured. So did their ancient knowledge of medicinal plants. Come on in. Have a seat. The old wisdom of medicinal plant use is still practiced at Den Paradera. This Curaçao woman, Sonia, is back for a visit. Like many from the Dutch Antilles, she now lives in the Netherlands. Sonia has experienced severe respiratory problems for the past two years, and modern medicines have failed to cure her. She has turned to Dina for help. Just wait here. I will go get the herbs for you. In her kitchen, Dina prepares several medicines made from medicinal plants to cure Sonia's ailment. They are old recipes passed on to her by island elders. In the beginning, when doctors know that I was working, you know, with the plants, they laughed at me. But sometimes I had doctors here in the garden and they still asking questions. But nowadays, I mean, I'm accepted on this island, I know. People come for advice, I can call a doctor, they know me, and I can ask what's the best medicine at this moment, are herbs the best? Because I believe that we have to work together. With Sonia's treatment complete, Dina leaves Den Paradera for a visit with some of her old friends. First on Dina's list today is to visit Sister Carmen. Sister Carmen came formally to iron my clothes. She was one of the number of healers that Dina chronicled in her book, Green Remedies and Golden Customs of Our Ancestors. So then we started to talk. I noticed that she knew a lot about herbs and that she wanted to conserve the herbs and that in her garden she had some herbs. So when she was ironing, I was asking. So I could sit with her for hours and hours and learning from, from Sister Carmen. What is this plant? This is Yerba de Ole. When a child has a fever, you can put it on their feet or you can give it to them as a tea. How do they do that? They mash it up and mix it with coconut oil and put it on the feet. They also put it behind the ear? Yes, the herb relieves the problem. Dina also stops by the home of another wise elder by the name of Chacha. Herbs are always good. Like chamomile, it will cleanse the insides. The sandura is always good for the stomach. Morning is the best time to drink herbs. This will give you a good appetite. If you have gas in your belly, you drink your mampuritu and you will get rid of the gas. I had a very good time with the chacha because she has been learning from her aunt of her mother. So she, she knew a lot about medicinal herbs. There are herbs that used to be easy to find. Now you don't see them anymore. Mampuritu is like that. You don't even see it in the schoolyards. It's all gone. It was important for Dina to document the wise words of these elders, for their generation has nearly vanished. Today, few young islanders show much interest in medicinal plants. What we need is people, young people, to learn the herbs from this country. At this moment, you see that plants and medicinal herbs are coming from Colombia, Venezuela, and Santo Domingo. 
A lot of them are sold on the market. I don't feel very well about that because it's, it's not the same culture as that of Curaçao. You can see on the market, it's dominating the culture of, of the island. There is more to Curaçao than its fanciful harbor front facade that greets incoming cruise ships. This city has the deepest harbor in the West Indies, making it a regional center for maritime commerce. Like many islands throughout the Caribbean, Curaçao is modernizing. Most people here enjoy the conveniences of modern drugs, doctors, and medical facilities. Because of this, much of the ancient knowledge of medicinal plants is being left behind. But the cultural legacy of healers like Sister Carmen and Chacha is not the only thing that is threatened. <laughs> The wild places where medicinal plants grow are also under attack from urbanization, industrial expansion, and increased development. More people and more growth are beginning to tax the Kanuku, Curaçao's fragile, arid countryside. Dina makes one more stop before returning home to Den Paradera. She heads for one of her favorite spots near the sea. Dina has become increasingly worried as the numbers of wild medicinal plants dwindle each year. She blames the oil refineries in part for upsetting the ecological balance. I'm very concerned. When the oil company came, they pumped a lot of water. So the water got down and people can make wells whenever they want. There are no rules. So we are losing the water that's under the ground. This year it was very, very hot, almost one year, no rain, so we are losing. Very old trees who are more than 200 years old. But Dina Ferris is not alone in her concern for the botanical wonders of Curaçao. Here, high on the slopes of Cristofel National Park, biologist John De Freitas searches for plants that hold potential medicinal cures. He works for a local institute called CARMABI, the Caribbean Marine Biological Foundation. They are doing baseline science, attempting to catalog the island's 500 plus plant species. The list has been cut to about 100 that show bacteria fighting properties. Here we have a number of endemic species. Endemic means uh, that they only occur or on only on Curaçao or on the leeward islands of the Netherlands and Thales that comprises uh, not only Curaçao but also Bonaire and Aruba. One such unique species, called Eugenia, is one of two rare plants that interests Defratis due to its strong antibacterial tendencies. The name of this plant is Eugenia procera. It's only found in the Caribbean. And on Curaçao, it's mostly found in the Christopher Park and is part of the Mitaceae family, to which also the eucalyptus tree belongs. John also gathers samples of the Divi Divi tree while on the mountain slope. It has shown a remarkable ability to fight staph infections. And there is a story of an old man, and he has very good eyesight, and he says that uh, due to the fact that he uses the Divi Divi leaves as an eye wash every morning, well, that's a very interesting uh, <laughs> connotation. DVDV was active against several microorganisms at also the highest level of activity. So it's a very interesting result. As John makes his way off Mount Christoffel, his work with Eugenia and the DVDV is just beginning. Back at the Karmabi Institute, the samples are dried. For those used in antimicrobial testing, ovens are used to speed up the process. For other samples that require examination of essential oils, the plants are spread out on a table. This drying process can take up to two weeks, and then the tests begin. 
Yes, these are the results of the uh, ten layer chromatography of the plants we screened for uh, antimicrobial properties. And to date, the, uh, de study has shown some promising results. A number of plants, including Eugenia and the Divi Divi, have shown strong activity against bacteria. This baseline science could lead other researchers in developing modern medicines based on the power of these ancient roots, stems, and leaves. In the year 2000, a study by Conservation International declared the Caribbean as one of the world's biodiversity hotspots, areas rich with flora and fauna of unique qualities. Curaçao, in spite of its arid terrain, is surprisingly biodiverse. But John, like Dina Firas, is concerned with the island's future. I'm concerned that certain areas that, that harbor certain plants, uh, unique plant species that doesn't occur anywhere else on the island, it would be a um, pity that those areas would be destroyed for uh, economic development. If you destroy those areas, you won't have them back. And it will be t take many decades for, um, to create areas similar to those with those uh, characteristics. That's why um, it's very important for these islands to look ahead and take into account conservation of these areas. But not all of the island's natural medicinal wealth lies on the land. In the early 1990s, American researcher Bill Gerwick discovered a blue-green algae called Lingia majuscula, or mermaid's hair. Bill was able to isolate a chemical compound from the algae that he named Curacin A in honor of Curacao. Early clinical studies showed that it had powerful anti-cancer properties. Today, Bill and his wife Lena, along with a crew from the Karmabi Institute, are getting ready to travel back to where this one-of-a-kind algae was discovered over a decade ago. some of our first collections uh, back in uh, December 1991. And we found that Curacao was very receptive to our coming and exploring their biodiversity for compounds that might be useful to treat uh, human diseases. The particular bay that we've come to focus on is uh, called Spanish water. So uh, what's really unique about the Spanish waters bay is that uh, the blue-green algae growing there it's, all, it's known as Lingvia majuscula. You can find Lingvia majuscula in other bays nearby. But when we looked at the Lingvia majuscula from the other bays, they didn't produce the same compounds. They produced other compounds that were quite interesting, but they didn't produce Curacin A. Salvador, you dive a computer or No, I This is a shallow dive, so, and it'll be less than an hour. No scorpions in there. <laughs> That's always nice to know. Gerwick and researcher Dolphy de Brot from Carmabi don their diving gear to revisit the rich collection site where the special algae was originally found. It's been several years since Bill collected here, and he is anxious to see what's below. This uh, mermaid's hair, or lingbia majuscula, as we know it in scientific terms, it's really quite a remarkable organism because it's actually a bacterium, but a giant bacterium. From the mangrove roots, it has one kind of a color. It's growing uh, somewhat back underneath the mangroves, growing down as trellises. Uh, they're kind of uh, uh, fluffy and have a, a really quite uh, beautiful reddish color oftentimes. The buried treasure here on this island, though, may not be on land, it may be in the sea. It may be some of these algae are creating molecules that will be enormously useful in uh, helping human society. Hey, that was some great stuff there. We got some good samples. Back on deck, 
Gerwig eagerly pulls out his field microscope and inspects the new collection. These red hairs, when we see them in the field, but here you can see that they're actually a whole series of little pancakes or coins stacked into these long filaments, and they're all encased in that uh, sheath-like material. That's really quite a remarkable organism. It's been really uh, nice to see that those algae are still living in that environment and are still quite healthy. So uh, this is the treasure trove of natural products that we've been studying for the last uh, nearly 15 years now. It's absolutely amazing the, the uh, diversity and biological activity of the compounds that this little seaweed's making. But after the excitement of the moment, Bill discovers a disturbing change in Spanish water. As their boat slowly leaves the bay, the beginnings of a new coastline development come into view. Really sad and really hard for me to see because it's going to destroy this habitat. This habitat that is very small and very unique and it's giving, given rise to this unique organism. We've not seen this organism anywhere else in the world. It will look just like it does over here. They're going to put in houses and docks and a marina and these kinds of things and it's going to substantially alter this habitat. I would fully expect the organism to disappear. So uh, when I see this kind of development going on and uh, uh, it just really alarms me because what they're doing is they're taking their future, this treasure trove of species and, and chemistry, and they're bulldozing it down, and we may never unearth this treasure again. The, the problem is that the uh, shoreline areas uh, are an integral part of your marine ecosystem. Particularly when you're urbanizing areas like this, you're going to put in uh, native, uh, non-native uh, trees that require pesticides to maintain. You're gonna be putting in lawns with a great deal of, of water. They'll require uh, nutrients, that is fertilizers uh, and uh, pesticides to maintain them too. And as a consequence, all that stuff leaches into the bay and destroys the habitat, contaminates it. The current island development plan, which was approved in 1997, approves about 90% of the shorelines of this bay for uh, urban uses and that will mean that this bay will essentially turn into an urban cesspool with just lined with homes no scenery no nature left and a mishmash of boats zooming around and we already are facing uh, human health related water quality problems in parts of the bay during parts of the year I can take you diving on that side of the bay and then you'll see beautiful white bottoms uh, ocean floor, but not due to white sand, which it should be, but due to toilet paper. Not only is the future of mermaid's hair in jeopardy, but Curasun A, its cancer-fighting compound, is also facing challenges in the laboratory. Initial tests were promising and showed the substance to be highly toxic to cancerous cells. But in later experiments at the National Cancer Institute in Bethesda, Maryland, Curacin A was found to have solubility issues and was unstable when tested in mice. These problems were a major setback for the development of the compound into a modern drug. And that said to us that the compound was unstable under the conditions of the, the body. So that has led subsequently now to an effort to refine that structure, make it a better molecule. And that's what we really should be looking to in nature. We should be looking for new ideas, new chemical templates, that we're gonna take that new chemical structure from the seaweed, and we're gonna translate it into a molecule that's gonna be an efficacious drug. We need to improve its water solubility and its stability in the body, and those efforts are taking place right now in various laboratories around the world. One such place is here at the University of Pittsburgh, where chemistry professor Peter Wythe has taken on the structural challenges of Curacin A. The molecule was uh, significant and interesting for us because it targeted a part of the uh, biological machinery within the cell that's quite crucial for its growth, particularly in cancer cells. Basically, cancer cells are very similar to normal cells. 
And that's why it's so difficult to develop effective uh, anti-cancer agents. Uh, but what we'd like to do is use the ability of structures such as kerosene A and the analogs that are developed on this basis to basically to move cancer cells into what's called apoptosis or programmed cell death, you know, cell suicide. Hello, Jane. How's it going? But first, Professor Whiff and his students had to tackle the inherent problems of kerosene A. They overcame the solubility issue, making a chemical hybrid structure much like other drug-like molecules that dissolve easily in water. They also solve the compound's sensitivity to light. It's a molecular tinker toy set, and we are able to build just about anything we'd like to build. And that's very satisfying, very challenging. You can truly take your visions and test them with the potential goal, of course, of improving uh, the environment, improving human health, improving living in general. Even though the new compound based on curacin A showed increased biological activity, it faced another problem when tested with lab animals. The compound metabolized too quickly due to the animal's enzymes, not allowing it time enough to attack the tumor. So we now know where the uh, sensitive parts of the molecule are. And so we can address the problems in terms of stability towards the uh, biological environment when the compound is actually given to an animal and is in the blood of an animal. But ultimately, we hope that then we will have indeed a compound that in the mouse will basically make human tumors disappear. But that's just the mouse system. So from there on, you have to go to a higher animal and reproduce the same findings. To make a modern drug from a natural substance is a long process, one full of delays and challenges. Peter Whiff estimates that the development takes two to seven years. That's not including the clinical trials that can take up to a decade before the drug is finally released to the public. We really would like to uh, see curacin A analogs move into the clinic and uh, test the hypothesis that we can develop an anti-cancer agent at the molecular level uh, that has the kind of effect that we're predicting, stopping cell division and uh, moving cancer cells selectively into cell suicide. We hope we can accomplish that. Uh, uh, but even if we don't get to the final drug molecule, we hope we can learn a lot about the process. So maybe with another natural products next time around, we'll be able to go all the way. So we have all this information. We can follow a single compound very well. Uh, but still a huge challenge and something that um, uh, you know, makes us very modest again is the fact that very often in the end, we cannot explain really what's going on. Uh, so we can see that some of these uh, uses of uh, the traditional medicine, the folk medicine, that they're very valid. If you look at the big picture, at the overall organisms, people do feel better. They can get better quite well. Back on Curacao, Dina Firis continues her one-woman crusade to save the traditional knowledge of island medicine and the desert's botanical wealth. Go bo, go bo, go be lo, be lo, be away. If the convergence of ancient roots and modern medicine is to continue, people like Dina are essential human links in this vital process. The future for medicinal plants of, of, in Curaçao is the hope that I have, the hope that young people can go on with this, the hope that my children will learn to be able to spread that my grandchildren would be able to know the herbs from the garden and the herbs from the mountain. That's the biggest joy I will have.
For more information on ancient roots, modern medicine, log on to www.rootsandmedicine.com.